Good morning and welcome to our monthly webcast on a very cold, very wintry and very snowy morning in uh, New York City. Sorry, our uh, webcast is starting uh, a little late because of weather related some system delays. Uh, uh, but we are ready to proceed with another uh, useful, educational and fascinating complex coronary intervention. This is session number 56 and uh, let me take you straight to the cardiac catheterization laboratory to Dr. Kinney and to Dr. Sharma. Yes. Samin, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I, I have always been surprised uh, how you are able to magically pull up uh, patients uh, on days such as this morning and uh, I want to set the theme by asking you a very earnest uh, question which uh, several uh, viewers have uh, posed to us. What exactly is the process? How do you select a patient for uh, doing the live transmission? Well, um, first uh, welcome all our viewers and uh, for a constant and continuous feedback and we welcome uh, uh, all of uh, you and uh, those whom uh, live as well as those who go to our uh, archived cases. But as you mentioned, the selection of a case, uh, particularly from the teaching point of view, is a very uh, important in the sense uh, that lot comes into the thought process. Now, one of them being that, yes, is it appropriate? Uh, and clearly, we have emphasized over the years that uh, idea is not that the lesion, 90% uh, lesion needs PCI but is it appropriate to do PCI based on the OCT criteria. So we clearly um, really trust and um, our system process enable us to select the appropriate case. Secondly, that uh, the patient has to have some educational value. Uh, every, as you saw that in every case, we try to make a technical tips so that our viewers can become as skilled as our um, us and the results also similar to what we obtain. So the, therefore, uh, many times this require convincing the patient. We did to speak to them uh, that you know you will be shown as that um, that we will be demonstrating this special technique, the procedures, and the most of the time, uh, by and large, patients are willing. Uh, patients and family are willing. So that they are well uh, educated about what they will be uh, the, when they participate in our live simple uh, this uh, complex cases or for that matter any of the live relay cases and they are appropriate the both patient and family agrees and they have a teaching value. So all that makes it uh, to the final selection of the case which comes out of out of our uh, about 380 to 400 uh, PCIs we do every month. So we select specific cases from there and knowing that these all cases are elective. So there no pressure, no rush uh, or hasty decisions are made in these patients. They are just done um, very electively after thorough discussion uh, amongst the staff at Sinai. Uh, myself, uh, Anu, as well as uh, the rest of my fellow staff and also the family and the patient. I am glad you clarified it because over the years uh, I have noted uh, the meticulousness and the determined efforts which go into choosing the most appropriate case. Uh, Samin, uh, what do you have in store for us today? Okay, great. So that we will go to, uh, uh, we start our slide presentation before we go on. Don't engage that. Don't engage. Come on. Uh, that um, basically these are our um, grant supporter for 2014 uh, and uh, these are the disclosures which are similar uh, by and large and uh, this case is uh, as you mentioned uh, case number 20 uh, with uh, our ACC partnership. This patient is uh, 82 year old male. He presented uh, about uh, earlier last month with exertional dyspnea and did have a negative stress MPI. Uh, but because the uh, cardiologist to uh, take care of the patient was very uh, sure that patient has a CAD, so they did a CTA. I don't know whether the value of the CTA in age of 82 with that calcium, but that did show extensive calcific three vessel disease which led to a cardiac cath uh, on uh, the January 10th, which revealed three vessel disease and normal LV function. Now, I know you want to show that angio? Yeah, we can go to the angio now. The left side first. Yeah. The LV function, which is normal, he had actually uh, EDP about 12, and then this is uh, his LED, prox LED, heavy calcium, you know, about 70 80 percent lesion, <laughs> small diag, but uh, you can see a D2 again 70 to 80 with the disease in the mid to distal. But then, if you see for the caudal picture, 
you have um, OM1 and uh, CERC uh, bifurcation moderate lesion, but important will be the LPL which is about 70 to 80 long disease involving um, again a bifurcating uh, OM2. So, and very calcific osteal lesion also yeah. of the LAD if you this see is, there. If we go to this is his RCA, heavy calcium significant disease in the prox, moderate disease in the mid and uh, a significant disease of the distal RCA which is involving a moderate size PD which is diffusely diseased. Yeah. And I think that decision will come once we start the intervention that should you do anything to that diffusely diseased uh, PDA in this particular case because even if you put your drug eluting stent of 2.25 with multiple of them uh, and long lesion it still will have a reach nose rate of 20 plus percent. So therefore, now we can go back to the our uh, uh, the slides. Now this patient has a syntax score of 36. Uh, clearly, uh, as our protocol with a high syntax score or multivessel disease, uh, patients are taken out of the cath lab. Discussion takes place with the family, the referring physician, and our interventionist, uh, as well as the cardiac surgeon. That's the most important. And the cabbage was recommended. So that patient had a formal surgical consultation and declined. Uh, at that time say well decide, went home uh, and pl placed on medical therapy. Besides the risk factor he had a prior CV in 2001 and that actually came in a very important decision making when we, uh, the, when the decision about the cabbage was done knowing that uh, we know consistently tra trials have shown of the cabbage, the recent meta analysis that uh, the CV rate is significantly higher in the P cabbage group compared to PCI in all the trials reported so far. Now patient was started on medication of uh, beta blockers and nitrates and were discharged and this is basically the individual uh, lesions which mentioned and therefore now we felt that uh, since patient continues to be symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy brought back for intervention and we felt that we do a part one today uh, of start with the right coronary artery and the left system will require multiple calcific lesions will require multiple stenting also and we have a live relay for ACC on uh, March 29th and 30th and this will be a beautiful case as a stage procedure of the multivessel PCI at that time. So that is where we are now. We put it into the uh, appropriateness use criteria. This is the three vessel disease and uh, patient on medical therapy makes it appropriate. Any question? Uh, Yes, far. one of the questions is of course I can uh, picking up on the theme of uh, 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 selecting a lesion uh, for live case, but uh, what went through your mind uh, before deciding uh, right coronary today and uh, the left system later? Well, I mean it is the same. Uh, we try to uh, that if once you start deciding what should be done and so knowing that this uh, particular case will require very extensive work on the left side and if you have a right uh, working reasonably well so that even for interventional point of view will provide you that added uh, safety because the data have shown if your right is disease and you are working on the left side uh, and something starts going downstream that really creates a you know higher complication. Makes, so that, uh, makes complete sense I think uh, the real uh, challenge and uh, the consideration would be whether you leave the PD alone and uh, uh, just looking at it, I am not sure also what your decision would be for the mid portion, but uh, we'll uh, confront that as we go. Yeah, and clearly the the proximal right corner is very very calcific yes. lesion. We can play once again. Yeah, look at this. Excellent, Heavy. I think excellent yeah. teaching case. Uh, there will be challenges with the calcification, uh, with the guiding catheter, and of course uh, decisions about the distal uh, segment. Right. And another, I think another important point also in deciding which vessel you want to do in multi vessel is you go to the tightest uh, lesion uh, depending on which vessel. So if I think if you t uh, consider uh, three vessel disease, tightest lesion is uh, in the proximal RCA and of course you have the dist uh, the LPL branch of the CERC uh, which probably you could leave it alone. That, uh, that's a very important point that we need to consider. Uh, when you are doing multivessel PCI. All absolutely uh, excellent considerations and uh, Samin, so what are you, what are the topics you are going to discuss this morning? Good, so the next 10 minutes I will talk about two things uh, particularly which has come up uh, the, with the recent publications of the transradial intervention or TRI PCI which we call uh, and the role of kissing balloon inflation in a bifurcation lesion uh, during PCI. Now as you know that uh, clearly the, the radial uh, craziness I call uh, 
or the everybody is on the radial bandwagon and the people want to do radial many of the centers have proclaimed themselves as the big radial center uh, because clearly the absolute i would say advantage of decreased vascular complication and maybe bleeding so this clearly is a radial has it on the side and now we actually have the two reports from the our national uh, ncdr american college of cardiology uh, the, the data registry uh, one is uh, for all patients and basically showing that in last 5 years from 2007 to 2012 the radial intervention has gone from 1% to 16.1% and of course men women or acute coronary syndrome if you see here that uh, STEMI patients still remain lower compared to your stable and acute coronary syndrome why because STEMI patient will require additional skill to do a radial intervention but overall i would say radial is up now this is in contrast to many countries in the world where radial is done almost 70% like in europe uh, france in india uh, that radial is done uh, 70 plus percent of cases one of the biggest reason is early embolization and lower vascular slash bleeding complication. Now, this actually has been shown. This is a radial PCI versus the femoral PCI. Again, uh, similar procedural success, lower vascular complication and bleeding complication uh, and shown with the adjusted as well as unadjusted ratio in this slide. The second from the same ACC and CDR is what about in the STEMI patients? And so, it turns out to be in the STEMI, the adoption of radial is less than a routine which is about 6.36 percent at present and what has shown the radial versus femoral which we know exactly that you have higher fluoroscopy time large higher in many studies actually you have a higher contrast volume although in this study there is a more contrast volume in the femoral group compared to radial but overall it seems to be that uh, the radial require extra timing and extra cro and higher crossover from radial to a femoral in about 6% of cases. But as far as uh, you talk about uh, the what has been shown in the STEMI patients and this actually follows the rival, uh, rival uh, study in, in the STEMI and acute coronary syndrome patient that STEMI there is a lower mortality and uh, the, the, since then there have been a few other reports that in the STEMI patients that uh, <laughs> associated uh, radial lower uh, mortality and largely because of decreased bleeding but at the same time there is a higher crossover consistently higher crossover as had been uh, shown uh, in this uh, this study also of the ncdr now then uh, there were two randomized trial which i want to discuss which were pre presented in last just two months uh, the two three months one is in the transradial pci in women because they have higher bleeding and vascular complication and safe pci was was done for that particular purpose and patients radial or femoral uh, all patients receiving bivalurin and 2b3a uh, inhibitor at discretion choice and of course p2y12 and idea was to randomize 3000 patients with knowing that about 60 percent get pci then we will have a data on the 1800 pci patient primary endpoint were two actually one was the efficacy and second the feasibility endpoint efficacy was the bleeding type 2 3 or 5 remember 4 is the cabbage uh, of the bark type so 2, 3 or 5 or vascular complication and uh, feasibility was exercise crossover which I to me I don't know why they try to make it as a primary endpoint that even in the experience center we know that radial is going to lose a for, to the femoral from the exercise crossover and secondly endpoint was basically procedural duration, total radiation dose, contrast volume and 30 day complication. Now basically these are uh, the endpoint definitions which were uh, adjudicated by a clinical uh, committee and basically what will happen is that uh, the, this was done as a registry that clearly they are done by the web based. So, no longer those forms and so uh, the, the randomization all done in the registry format first of its kind which was done in United States similar trial was done taste uh, for the uh, in uh, Europe uh, in France uh, for uh, thrombus suction and so. So, clearly it was a registry based trial on the internet and uh, patients were randomized and what happened is that trial as you we all know was aborted. After 1120 patients who were randomized routine review of uh, by the data safety monitoring board when they reviewed the data showed that primary efficacy event rate was lower than expected trial unlikely to show any difference even if you go to 3000 patients. So, they recommended termination of the trial 
and there was no de definitely no harm of the radial versus femoral. What were the data? And these are the patients of 1700, uh, is about 900 uh, patients in each group and about uh, half of them got the PCI. Now the data are complete and these are more of elective patients and basically two groups you need to have. One all total randomized cohort and other is the PCI cohort and basically showed what we knew that the bleeding in total randomized group was the lower uh, in the radial group uh, bleeding or the vascular complication in the radial group compared to a femoral group. But exercise crossover was 6.7 percent in the radial and femoral. So nothing un unusual, nothing surprising. And the second point was in the PCI cohort, you actually there was no much difference in bleeding and still there was a crossover rate of 6 plus percent. So you can say that basically what trials showed, uh, what we knew already, nothing new was shown, have a, but more importantly that in this day and age, by using bivalutin, we did not see a difference in the bleeding or vascular complication with the radial. So that was a very important big uh, dampening in the enthusiasm to the radial fanatics that really that if you need to do it fine, but it is not that you are improving the outcome of the patient, particularly the female in this group. Uh, and of course, the procedure duration longer with the total uh, radiation dose longer, uh, higher and so and so forth as shown in this uh, study without any difference in the secondary end point of the 30 day. Uh, as you can see here, 5.2 percent versus 3.4. So rather uh, opposite. Now only thing is the patient preferred the exercise uh, for the next procedure, radial versus femoral. But you know, this is not correct. Unless you have a patient who has exp experience of both of them, then you talk to the patient, your next procedure should be radial or femoral, then only make a difference. But asking, once you have one approach, it does not make sense. But overall, consistently, it has been shown by the data that if you got a radial, next time patient may, most of the time, they will prefer the radial approach again. Then, the basically, it, it, uh, the data of the safe PCI was first in the sense of registry bait, based study and uh, overall did not show any difference. So that clearly does not make sense uh, in terms of recommendation point of view from safety point of view, rather it will cause more time delay and exercise crossover. Second study was published also few months ago was what about in the cabbage patient, which is a radial cabbage trial uh, and basically showed that about 237 patient screen, randomized 128, half to transfemoral, half to transradial and basically show the primary endpoint was the contrast volume. And what happened? Radial axis has a higher contrast volume and see also the procedural time, fluoroscopy time, radiation time, everything bad in favor of radial. So if you have a cabbage patient, do not do radial and of course once you decided, this is all cases of a barely 127 patient, but once you decided on the angiography that the radial uh, you have done your um, coronary anatomy, the PCI was no difference in terms of contrast volume or procedure or so. So basically the diagnostic, uh, if you want to do a cabbage case, diagnostic is not a way to go. So cabbage should not be, the radial should not be done in cabbage patient. What happened? Same thing which I said that uh, uh, transradial is preferred in almost 50, in 60 plus, 60 to 65 to 70 percent uh, of cases compared to radial, the femoral was which was preferred in about 30 percent of cases. So basically uh, other endpoints that lower ad hoc PCI in the radial group, higher excess crossover and similar vascular complications. So basically the, this I would say the trial was while the safe PCI was neutral kind of uh, and radial cabbage trial definitely was negative. So where do we put it? This is my recommendation that increasing TR volume that there are groups where there is no benefit or harm, cabbage patient radial spasm, AV fistula, aortic arch anomaly, those cases to me radial do not even think about. Where is the benefit of bleeding or vascular complication? In patients who are high risk for bleeding, patient with bleeding diathesis, high INR, I think the overweight patients, patients with peripheral arterial disease, probably that is where the radial will really work. In women and routine, I think the data has shown does not support. What it really is the decreased mace and bleeding is by the STEMI and ACS patient, particularly STEMI by rifle stacks study, rival and uh, of course the latest NCDR data. So I think overall if your lab is doing about 20 percent, 16 to 20 percent of radial in appropriate case it is probably the right number rather than going to your 70, 80 percent. So quickly the second point is the kissing balloon inflation. Now we all know that when you uh, put a stent in the main vessel, your side branch get occluded. Uh, then you have to go through the stent struts and then you need to do a kissing balloon dilatation because you deform the stent. But question is that if you have, you put a stent across 
and nothing happened to the side branch, should you do a routine kissing balloon inflation? There are three studies, Thubis, Nordic 3 and Corporal Kiss, all have shown, basically shown in this, study, this uh, um, the table uh, in terms of the death, MI, TLR, mace or stent thrombosis, no difference with the important point I have put in this uh, bar graph, the kissing balloon in the yellow and non-kissing balloon inflation in red that no difference in the TLR, mace or stent thrombosis rather in some cases little opposite going into the kissing balloon, but overall no significant difference. So, you can say that unless your side branch is compromised, you are not going through the stent strut, there is no need to do a kissing balloon inflation in the single stent strategy. Now, we know that once you go through the stent strut, you deform the stent clearly because of uh, the going through the cells and now whole issue comes is that how can you go uh, the, should you go to the proximal stent strut or the distal stent strut and this is actually the whole issue which has come up that if you go through the proximal stent struts, you do not have a full coverage, nice coverage of the ostium of the side branch, but if you go through the distal part of the strut into that overlapping in the ostium of the side branch, then you really cover the ostium of the side branch very well, you, can you see here which is the closest to carina. So, one stent becomes like 1.2 and how can you get to this uh, to the lower part or distal part of the uh, the cell rather than to the proximal cell and that is where the whole concept comes is we call proximal optimization technique pot and basically what happens is that you take a short balloon after your stent should be uh, one to one to the distal vessel, but the proximal vessel you take a large balloon to the main vessel and then you, which is ends at the level of the ostium of the side branch and then you inflate. And the purpose there is that you have optimized the proximal stent. So now, when you are trying to put a wire, your wire will likely to go to the distal strut rather than the proximal strut. And this is what the whole proximal optimization technique is all about. And this actually has been elegantly shown that uh, gives rise to a better uh, side branch coverage uh, compared to compared to your routine uh, advancing the wire. Now, then there is another co concept which is coming. The should it be a kissing balloon or sequential dilatation of the side branch or main vessel and this is actually based on the data that when you do a kissing balloon you use the two balloons and proximally they over inflate and, uh, and same uh, that maybe uh, sometimes you try to go through the proximal part of the stent struts as shown in those schematic diagrams on the right side in this case and also have shown that you cause more flow abnormality. Maybe that by over dilatation of the proximal part of the stent uh, in the main vessel, you create more flow abnormalities and maybe that is causing a higher uh, thrombosis and re -stenosis. And uh, this actually has been shown that malopposition of the stent that once you use a two step of, of uh, sequential dilatation rather than the kissing uh, it may be better and this is actually shown uh, as uh, this uh, experiment. Now, the personally when we are done the sequential, I am not very happy with the sequential approach, I am very happy with the uh, proximal optimization, but uh, many times the sequential approach in the clinical practice I have seen that you still have a plaque shift and you have to go back and dilate uh, the side branch again after the main vessel, but it still need to be seen. The also very important issue that we may see angiographically very tight lesion 80, 90 percent, but FFR in many groups is actually more than 0.8, so therefore it could be just the artifact of the vessel. So, that we have to be very careful that not every lesion which seems to be compromised by the stent in the main vessel, this is the similar data I have been shown earlier uh, that almost 30, 32 percent of cases that you have a 80 percent, more than 50 percent lesion, but FFR is uh, more than 0.8 uh, and therefore, uh, bifurcation I would say indication for kissing balloon will be the side branch compromise, decreased flow, FFR less than 0.8, PTC of uh, side branch via stent struts two stent strategy and down and lastly I would say the downstream lesion for future need for PCI. So, very important that these will be in my opinion indication for kissing balloon inflation and not a routine uh, inflation routine indication. Uh, with that note uh, we are ready here, uh, actually we are work, uh, Anu has started, uh, AK, you tell us what is going on now. Okay, we just uh, wired it, actually if you see here. You could, I think you could go both approach whether you want to do primary wiring or uh, you want to take um, you know over the wire balloon or a fine cross, you can use your yeah. workhorse wire. We actually took a fielder, <coughs> crossed the lesion 
and uh, I think the goal should be that we are not going to work on the PDA which is uh, you know small size vessel diffusely diseased maybe leave it alone uh, in that, that situation do not wire the PDA. So, I went with the wire in the AV continuation. And that is a very important point we say that if the, there is a downstream lesion and you are not planning to do PCI try not to wire that because the studies have shown particularly in the diabetic patients that just wiring these patients come back with the progression of the lesion even if there is no lesion but definitely if it is a moderate lesion they will come back with the significant lesion at uh, follow up. So, I mean I think that is a very wise decision uh, even the ostium of the PDA was not involved it is very diffusely diseased small vessel and uh, might as well uh, stay with the primary target. Uh, I know which fielder wire is this? What balloon we have? Mm -hmm. Fielder, regular fielder. Okay. fielder. Yeah. Samin, uh, what is the plan uh, thereafter? Uh, looking at some uh, plaque modification yeah. with the. Uh, yeah, with this uh, such a calcific. What is it? The, therefore, what we are using it, um, we can show uh, uh, the orbital atherectomy, diamond back uh, 360, which is a 1.25 millimeter bar, and uh, it actually rotates at 2. 80,000 and 120,000 rpm and uh, basically compared to the difference from the rota is that uh, stop flushing yeah. we can uh, zoom that yeah. uh, if you can see here the compared to the rota when there is a conical shape then the diamond chips are at the cone here it is the crown and the diamond chips are at the convex border at the crown uh, and therefore and then the bar not only rotate uh, advance uh, anti gray you know longitudinally but also uh, rotate so in the orbit in the sphere and so that higher the speed bigger is the lumen and basically just do the sending they call it a sending um, uh, of the plaque. Samin so, uh, two follow up questions uh, come from this uh, first of all uh, uh, people who have uh, watched you who have uh, come to dozens maybe hundreds of your teaching uh, courses over the last uh, decade or so this used to be your uh, typical rotablator lesion yes and that is correct absolutely but at the same time we also learned that despite all the teaching use of rotablation is still less than 2% while heavily calcific lesions are 8 to 10% in the uh, most of the studies and most of the labs so why there is a disconnect one of the biggest reason is that uh, the patient uh, the, the physicians are not comfortable so now that is where the CSI uh, this uh, orbital atherectomy comes in very easy setup very easy to use and cause less hemodynamic compromise. So therefore we are trying to myself I would say with the having the big being the biggest rotablator user is trying to find a niche of both the devices that where particularly in this 3.5 millimeter vessel you say well 1.25 bar what is it going to do well let us see and this will be the part of the teaching as well as learning for myself we have done now about 55 plus cases uh, but trying to really find the niche of individual uh, individual of uh, these uh, uh, atherectomy devices and uh, our paper which we have we put a review article which will be coming out in May about uh, the, the, the algorithm ACT? of treatment of this calcium ACT? regions. And uh, how what would be your uh, your I mean I can understand the benefits of um, you know moderate to heavy calcification but uh, what is your answer to some uh, conservative uh, interventional physicians who would just want to put a non-compliant balloon and stent? Well I, I would say that is one of the of the uh, strategy which we have shown that uh, the non-compliant balloon or sometimes you put a wire uh, side by side. Okay, we'll show the point yeah. that now the wire. Yeah, the, one the wire of the uh, issue with this uh, device is the same. So the wire has come back, um, but we do, no no, advancing the wire would be it's not. Yeah, it's compared not to the rota, uh, the many time your wire comes back, you can always advance on the dinaglide. Here, advancing the wire is very difficult on uh, you know advance while the the diamond back is in the body orbital atherectomy. So, that is a one issue uh, which we found. So, have to be very very careful when you are uh, advancing uh, the device that, that there is a enough pull not too much pull. So, this is the lock you lock it. Yeah, but we have to come out so, clearly no need of a dedicated guide wire for this. 
No, yeah, this, this is a is dedicated a, guide it, wire. They have their special oh, right. wiper uh, wire. How does this handle compared to the rotor wire? But wire is much easier, 0 0.012 compared to 0 0.009, and it's a very steady wire. Uh, but only problem is that many times in the exchange that it's a not lubricaceous, so that many times the wire comes out or advances like happened in this case, despite the careful advancement. But definitely the end, and you can advance the stent on this wire. Now this is starting, now you can see at the 80,000 RPM uh, and slow advancement, uh, about 1 millimeter um, at a time. And this is a constant advancement compared to the rota when packing, that you come, you touch and come back, touch and come back here, because it's the crown on the convex surface, you continue for your 20 seconds and pull back. Yeah. And usually same. 20 seconds at a one time, actually there is an inherent mechanism in the device that will stop, give you a beep at 25 seconds and uh, you know so that clearly it want not to go further than uh, uh, 20 um, seconds. Now you want to take so a So other break. difference also is that uh, rota, you know it does atherectomy only when you go forward. This does it while going forward and backward. Actually I have increased the speed now. Now the speed will be 120. You can see the here the noise. When you are doing rota, normally you have some resistance and you know you are going through the lesion, which you do not see with the orbital atherectomy. Yeah, and part of the lesion is because you are not coming in contact uh, at the lesion constantly because the bur is rotating. Yeah. So, increasing yeah. the speed, uh, why did you increase the speed here? Because, because uh, we crossed. We crossed, we crossed the 80. The 80,000 will give you about 1.5. 1.5 millimeter uh, internal lumen diameter of the vessel MLD. Once you go to 120, it will give you about 1.8 to 1.85. So, it is similar to like your 1.75 bar, that is what we would were used by the rotation track in this particular case. And those are the only two speeds available at the so moment? At present, yeah. And then they are looking, they are actually submitting the data of the 1.5 bar, which can give you a lumen of to 2.25, right. uh, but it is uh, not approved by the FDA yet. So, two major things you have discussed about the ease of use and uh, hopefully decreased uh, complications such yep. as distal embolization. Yes. Yep. And this exactly it is. See that now? There is no bradycardia, no hypotension. In this case, with a rotablation, ablation, we will be giving neo, we will patient with atropine and so. This clearly is very well tolerated uh, compared to others. Now, only question is, do we need to go to distal? No. no. The lesion calcium was only the only heavy the calcium proximal. was in the proximal area. So, we do not need to. So, we can out. come out. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, what you do is release yep. the brake and release start brake. coming out. Yeah. But key is everything at the hand. That is the key. There is no uh, extra nitrogen tank. It is all electric. It is all electric driven. Now, you have to be careful once you are ready to come out and I am working with the engineers that maybe the proxy, distal part of the wire should be lubricated because many, it is not uncommon when you are ready to take the bar out that uh, your wire also uh, comes back. Uh, Give me a run through wire. Yeah, we have it. See, yeah. it is a very difficult, but you know, if you are extremely careful, then we will be fine. Now we can stop the flush. Okay. So, run. overall, uh, what is your uh, sense of after you complete uh, orbital atherectomy versus uh, rotational? Uh, what do you think uh, is more effective in just going the real primary intent, which was to do a plaque modification? I would say there is same, no, that is a very, very important question and we actually do, I would say I do not have any answer for it, but very soon I will have answer for it because we are planning uh, to do exactly do what you are asking. That is the try to find out the lumen gain in a randomized way in a small group of patients by doing a OCT and IVAS to give you lumen as well as the degree of calcification which has been ablated uh, with these two techniques. So, we have put that program to the IRB once we start and I would say in about three months, I should be able to answer that question that which is more effective device in terms of decreasing the calcium burden or thickness of the calcium and secondly, improving the, uh, the lumen by decreasing the total plaque burden. And in, in doing that, you will use, uh, make it IVAS based? Uh... IVAS as well as OCT. Okay. OCT because really the calcium, uh, you know, you need both of them and also really mechanism that uh, is it really cutting it uh, that what uh, we know that rotablation has shown and the OCT data also have shown uh, by using uh, 
uh, by the orbital atherectomy that you really make the cuts into the plaque, but more of a spherical rather than the eccentric cutting which is done by the uh, by the rotablation. So, if the distal embolization hopefully is less, uh, yeah. how does that translate into use of uh, pacemakers? Are you using it uh, we, same indications like rotational atherectomy? I would say at present till we get our experience of 100 plus cases, the recommendation is the same. Like in this patient, the patient did not even require a single uh, paste bead. Patient has a temporary pacemaker, but did not require the bead at all. So, therefore, now in this particular case, we know by our historical experience that we will have a higher chance of the pacemaker uh, use. But, uh, but right now, it's still recommendation is the same. No, so, I mean, any cost first. comparisons have been done by somebody? No, no, not yet. Yeah, not yet. There is a question is coming to you from Dr. Carlos Nieves, uh, who follows us closely and routinely. Are you, I am going to read it exactly. In such very proximal RCA lesions, do you plan to cover the true ostium with the stent? That is a very good point and I think we will decide once uh, we in a different view that if the ostium 2-3 millimeter is spared, then do not do it because we know ostium by definition have a higher chance of restenosis, but provided we are 2-3 millimeter of the lumen. So, now we go to a little caudal view and try to see whether the ostium is involved or not. Anu, you are using the second wire as a, a potential buddy wire or you will remove that? Uh, or no, actually, you can, yeah, can take it out. Yeah. The, we are just trying to decide which we take. I mean, do we do the mid RCA right. yes, redilation? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think we should. What about do it the now. distal? We do all of them. Yeah. And then, of course, the next question is going to be a single 38 millimeter or uh, two stents. I think stents. 38 will not cover it. Yeah, it probably won't. See, no? As soon as you took the wire, the balloon is not going distal. Yeah, yeah, so it would uh, advance? Yeah. Do you think uh, the mid lesion also requires uh, some uh, some orbital atherectomy no, too? No, no. Again, I think it's just a question of give me another wire, the field of wire. You need double yeah. wire. That's yeah, no. I think this is the kind of case you need two wires. Mm. Yeah, it will yeah, go. Okay, Rob. here it goes. Uh, just when you threaten the yeah. second wire. Yeah. The only thing is how long, right? Do we put? Uh, yeah, that was a soft lesion. Now, as you saw, that orbital atherectomy went very nicely from the proximal lesion and the lesion opened up and that is the most important thing which we have noted that despite this 1.25 bar, the bar does its job that uh, you are able to dilate such a calcific lesion. Okay. You have to go distal now. 3-5, it's three five. Okay. Three five. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, should not have gone now. Some die, die. some die. Okay, yeah, good. Good. Moderate so, pressure. 15 though. Yeah. You are not going to put a, you want to put a 12 stand there. So 15 will be okay. So, I mean a few follow up questions on your transradial presentation. Uh, what is uh, the use of transradial uh, access at Mount Sinai and what is your and Dr. Kinney's uh, two extremely experienced interventional cardiologists, what is, what would be your crossover rates? Well, I would say that uh, one Overall in our lab now, the transradial is about 14 percent, similar to what is in the national at present. The second, in terms of the, the in, in terms of the individual, uh, the need, you have to take the guide out a little bit, the, the need for uh, the, you know, for us that in percent, uh, percent of cases that uh, clearly that uh, Dr. Keeney does not use much of the transradial, uh, the her number may be much lower. Uh, and I still use about uh, 10 to 12 percent of cases and uh, I uh, very strict from my point of view it once you decide it, we will go transradial. If right does not work, then you go to the left. So, I actually, there are clear orders in my cath lab that if you are using transradial, do not prep the femorals and groin. Uh, so, I would say that my crossover rate will be, once I decide it in those 10, 12 percent, that crossover rate will be like maybe 1 or 2 percent only. Any experience with the trans ulnar? We have no experience here. I know there are some t report about the trans ulnar also. Uh, now let's decide the stent use. Actually, we had our uh, radial, uh, you know, if uh, maybe almost 18 months ago, we actually showed how to prep radial, how to do radial. I think uh, even at that time, I was very clear 
that I am totally against uh, radial mainly because for me I think a radiation dose is very high for the operator no matter what people say and for high volume operators like us we got to make sure that our radiation dose is always covered especially if they are having trouble and we have to come uh, closer to the patient it is uh, a lot harder and uh, the cases that we get uh, to be done like this kind of patients and patients are real complex cases uh, they are uh, actually harder to be done uh, through radial I mean we do not get uh, primary simple cases anymore. Yeah and the view at the distal national 3 o yeah. Uh, yeah. 3 or no, no, it could be 3 5. Okay. So, I mean another uh, 3 or 3.5 uh, 16, we use the promos element. Another uh, good question, I do not, uh, I am trying to track down uh, who is asked, uh, but here is the question after either uh, rotational or orbital etherectomy, should we further use cutting balloon or scoring balloon to get uh, more plaque modification? I would say very important, yes. If the vessel is uh, like 3.5 or 4 millimeter, and so, and on angiogram, you see uh, that uh, basically still there is a tight, uh, significant lumen left, uh, is still obstructed. So, I would say that maybe a scoring balloon or cutting balloon is required in about 20% uh, of cases. You have 4 millimeter vessel, you have done a 1.25 bar of the orbital atherectomy or 1.75 bar of the rotation atherectomy, that using a 3.5 angiosculpt or 3.5 poro uh, flex tome will be reasonable to give you a good. Uh, which we call a rota or orbital atherectomy cut, um, you know, approach so that you have a better lumen uh, dilatation uh, before stenting. Because key is that once you have a stent there, or to expand that stent will be very difficult. So they had to be very very careful that your lesion has been fully prepared and that calcium has been removed. Because studies have shown that once you like osteo trial and so you want to go on the rota uh, on the fielder, no? I mean, yeah. run through. You want to go on a uh, fielder now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because studies have shown that if you have heavy calcium, no matter how high you go, even if you do have some rotation atherectomy, that uh, you will not be able to expand the stent and we have seen it many times. I yes, think after doing atherectomy, first thing you have to do is take a non-compliant balloon. Um, the best thing is to go one, one to one vessel size and then go high pressure dilate and that is the time you can make a decision whether you have been able to dilate. And uh, if you are not dilated, then you think of uh, using a cutting balloon, any of those uh, cutting balloons to make sure that the lesion will expand, provided you have done good atherectomy. Yeah, this is a 3.5? Yeah, 16. 3.5, 16 promise. Good. It looks good. very good. Yeah. Routinely, you should not... Um, think that after a, a threat, I mean that right. you want to do a cutting balloon. Right. So, right. you used this yeah. hair, uh, you deliberately did not go beyond the bifurcation? Yeah, we kept a millimeter away from the PDA. PDA. Okay. Good. Okay, now, now, what only question 12? is whether 3, 5, that 38, huh? 38 may not yeah. cover. Yeah. That uh, well, that 38 will cover the lesion or you need to put two stents uh, for the mid Let's and the proximal segment. Also, we bring back, take a picture of the ostium, yeah. right? And then we saw the ostium. Ostium is not uh, involved, so that we can leave that ostium. Yeah, it's not uncommon these patients that uh, you know become little uncomfortable while lying on the table and so. Yeah. So you see, what I did was I took the prox the wire when you are dilating the stent, just kept proximal to that. Now you can advance the wire again. So your body wire. You will need a buddy wire help again for the mid RCA stent. I want to take a picture so we decide whether a 38, 38 will not cover. Samin, any preference uh, you are having these days for the drug eluting stents? Has to be. For certain lesions you are uh, think some. Yeah, some I would the say the calcific lesion, the, what uh, had been shown that for the calcific lesion when you really need the, uh, the radial strength, the. Go. the 3, 5, 16. Uh, yeah, Another exactly. one, yeah. 3516 and proximal is 4024. Yeah. That uh, in the basically in a non, uh, the, in a very calcific lesion like when you do the atherectomy, that we prefer uh, the promus element because of this platinum chromium, uh, that it gives you more uh, the radial strength in those cases. And also, the although the promus premier now, that you have less issue in terms of the longitudinal force shortening, but we are still trying to avoid them 
in a very proximal lesion. Now, besides that, the all the, I would say that uh, particularly the newer generation with the Promus Premier as well as the Zions Expedition are similar to Resolute Integrity. Because Resolute Integrity, I would say, before uh, the introduction of these three plus generation uh, stents of both Boston Scientific and Abbott, probably was the most possible and uh, the, the most deliverable uh, stent, I would say. And even now, in a rare, rare case where you cannot get 8 millimeter of uh, Promus or uh, Promus Premier or Zion's Expedition, that Resolute Integrity will go, uh, may go, I would say. Because I would say that now about 50-50 in the past, uh, that used to be very high. But the key is that um, the, the, the basically in those cases, I, I know the, the, the Resolute Integrity has uh, indication from the diabetic point of view in the diabetic patients, uh, clearly. Uh, but uh, that is not swaying because we have seen the data of both uh, Zion's Expedition and so, that even in diabetics, uh, the, that uh, clearly, uh, you know, benefit. Now, benefit may be less compared to non-diabetic, but it's still uh, quite important. So, that, just, that alone is not a decision making uh, in our uh, tree. Pop. Okay. Now, we are going up. This is a 3.5. 16. Another 16 for the mid. Now, this one we can go to 16 atmosphere. So, Anu, once again, you brought the wire proximal there. Yeah. Okay. And once what you do is <coughs> you deploy the stent, take out the balloon, and then you can go back with the wire. So, I mean, for all the three stent uh, platforms, uh, the Zions, the Promus, and the Resolute uh, anti-platelet uh, strategy is the same? It's about the same, yes. Uh, now, what has been shown that if you really need a very short duration of anti-platelet therapy, uh, that three, uh, three months or even one month or so, maybe in those cases, although we don't use it, Endeavor might be a reasonable stent. You want to just dilate the proximal with this balloon? Okay. Uh, but that, that was 352. Yeah. But, but overall, that uh, the rest, uh, in rest of the cases, the, our anti-platelet therapy approach is uh, identical. Uh, uh, now, there is enough data on the Zions actually, as you know, the European recommendation that you can decrease it to a three months. 3520, right? 24 no, 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 too long. Proximal more, longer. 4024. I see the ostium is not involved. Now we are able to see that. So we will just cover that area. Now my question is why do not we cover from the distal to the proximal, uh, from the mid lesion? So there is no reason to not to cover it. Mm. Otherwise you may have a little dissection, there is a moderate calcium, that use of 4028. 32 I think. Or 32. Yeah, 432. So, you would overlap yeah. there? Yeah, the we overlap, part. right? Yeah. I mean, okay. why to risk uh, this? There is a little ash dissection. Well, there is a moderate calcium there anyway. So, that we are not achieving and there is no branches. So, there is no negative uh, of uh, covering that from uh, uh, just few millimeter from the ostium uh, to the proximal part of the mid uh, stand. So, we will use now 432. You want to do the um, OCT in that? No. Not sure anything. Samin, so, how's your uh, BBS uh, experience coming along? Yeah, but the, very good. Uh, particularly more uh, out of US than US here. We are still part of the our absorbed three trial, which is ongoing, which actually has done uh, just about getting completed. I think it's about 1,700 of the 2,200 patients have been randomized, which is the two to one randomization, and uh, the trial is still ongoing. That mid uh, point has been looked into it that uh, the the safety point of view, so that's a good point. And uh, the trial ongoing, of course, we need to see uh, what will be the ultimate in terms of uh, the efficacy and so. We know that uh, BVS stent is very good, uh, but uh, the issue always comes uh, that uh, that to, since the Zions has the lowest stent thrombosis. So coming back to your point uh, was uh, that of the three. The one of the big difference also would be that when there is the issue about the stent thrombosis. Now, we know there is head to head comparison of the sum of the, uh, of the new th uh, three stents uh, approach, uh, I mean three stents um, uh, comparison that Zions still remain the lowest in terms of the stent thrombosis. So that is to me very, very important. So any time when you have an issue about the thrombosis, that patient may not take uh, antiplatelet therapy for the longer time, that it will be reasonable to uh, are on the Zion side because there you need a shorter duration of antiplatelet therapy, maybe just a three months 
and we know okay, that so that is associated with a lower uh, stent thrombosis. Go for it. Anu, share with us exactly how you would uh, position uh, as to the proximal. But, yeah, so I think what you do is <clears throat> when it's promus, you see the stent uh, a millimeter inside the dot there. You definitely can give two millimeters uh, away from the ostium, but since it is a 32 millimeter stent, uh, you saw that would not make a turn. I think we are still uh, yeah, 2 millimeters away from the ostium. Yeah, which is fine. If you pull back, yeah. you want to, up? you could no. come up to the ostium. No, no, we do not need uh, it. No. Okay, then we go up. Okay. We are going up now. And now, since you and have now the you see that the other body wire is completely out. It is in the guide. Yeah, and here you can go to high pressure uh, like 16 or maybe 18, but you still will require a post dilatation with a 4 0 um, 15 uh, non compliant. So, I mean, just take a look at this. Uh, this uh, picture which you took, do you think uh, the inferior part of the stent still has some calcification yeah, that yeah. could have been ablated we better? To post, uh, dilate better? Yeah. So therefore, we need to, although the balloon inflated that time. No, I'll tell you yeah. why I, I made that observation because one of our viewers uh, pointed exactly that that yeah. uh, in some of these lesions uh, would uh, cutting balloon have uh, given you probably more forward, and uh, backward, forward, backward. Yeah. See, no, that is true. Stent. So that uh, many of these cases, once you combine. Uh, that uh, cutting balloon may give an additional um, advantage, so that uh, that is a, you know I would say there is a right approach to do in this particular case that after having done the rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy that uh, you're using the the adjunct, adjunct uh, the scoring or uh, the um, uh, cutting balloon basically in this case. So that now the lower part of the calcium which we know and we know that these are heavy calcific lesions that no matter what you do, you will always will have a little rim of that calcium that not able to expand. So that, uh, but need to be careful, but yeah, I would say that point well taken that in this particular case proximally, maybe we should have done 3.5 angio sculpt, go to high pressure and uh, before uh, uh, we decided for the stenting. No, I would have said that we probably should have gone with the 4 or non-compliant and uh, gone high pressure. That is okay We too. can see it now when we right. post dilate will uh, uh, open up. Because you got to think of the cost also if you already done one atherectomy and then you are going to go with the cutting balloon. The initial cost uh, of uh, orbital atherectomy compares uh, with the rotational? Yeah, it is about uh, two, uh, you know, it is clearly that it's, it's this whole no. cost issue is in, uh, you know, process, but, uh, but uh, the way it has been, it is about, uh, in my opinion, will be like uh, that twice 18. the cost, 18. 2 to 2 and half times of the cost of uh, the rotational atherectomy at present. But it comes, it as I mentioned, uh, that uh, rest of uh, the, the comfort level with the orbital atherectomy. Therefore, the whole issue, because until we get the DRG uh, for the calcific lesion, uh, really oh, yeah. the use of uh, these devices will remain limited because it is an additional cost. Because many times you say, well, maybe I can just do a balloon dilatation. I can tell you like this okay. particular case. Yeah. You cannot do that with a balloon dilatation only. You need to do a atherectomy. Well, the other difference is that you don't need a multiple burst strategy. Yes. A single, uh, that's all you use it in a single case and uh, a single device takes care of the procedure. Yes. Yep. For a... Yeah. This is a 4-0? Yeah, 4 yeah. Don't go too high. Good. Yeah. 16. 16 that area, approximately we went 20. So just to gain more experience, are you using uh, more uh, orbital atherectomy than uh, rotational these days? Well, I would say that uh, at our um, center, we do about 40. So it's about 50, 50 uh, percent at present uh, because any case uh, uh, we have, you know, particularly very proximal, we are still concerned about because it may ablate the guide, osteal lesions. Uh, which is actually is not indicated. A uh, second patient with a total occlusion, uh, patient who had a PCI already and we could not open the lesion. Uh, these cases also, we are preferring uh, orbital atherectomy, but I am going to make an algorithm soon right. uh, that the which and where uh, is the one preferred over other because I know that majority of the cases you can do either, but in some cases you will like to do, uh, you know, the one device will be indicated over other. What do your fellows like? Uh, fellows are clearly light, uh, I mean they like actually, let us ask the fellows. Yeah, I have I, the two fellows here. 
uh, Ritesh Patel and uh, uh, Ravindra. Guys, tell us. What do you like if you have a choice? One, only one choice. Choice between the two, you are going to be okay. going out and practice in a few months. Rota what or would you use? <laughs> one choice. Uh, no explanation. Yes or which one? Rota. Okay. All right. My fellow is still on the rota side. <laughs> that means we train them well to do rota. Yeah. Look, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a very important observation they have. Uh, anu, in the meantime, uh, inferior part of the stent. Uh, a little bit, yeah. You, yeah, still, still needs something yeah. or? No, no, I think you have to leave no. it alone. Okay. Uh, it's eccentric calcium. We have gone up uh, 4 or 20 atmospheres. After this, you are uh, uh, thinking of... Uh, Okay, so now a person uh, with your uh, experience, how do you think would have been this result with the rotational? Same? Similar? Uh, I, I, I will have some other different opinion. I okay. would say a 175 bar right. or a 2 bar would have done a, a different job. That Excellent. inferior part may not be, would not have been seen. Look, that's entirely the purpose of this transmission and hopefully helping uh, people uh, make the right uh, choices. Uh, in this view, the vessel looks excellent, no? Yeah. But our goal was the same, leave the diffuse uh, disease Right, uh, I think that's, that's a good choice, uh, although oh. I'm, uh, in, in this view, the vessel looks much bigger than what uh, it appeared in the other. Yes, and, uh, and the extent <coughs> clearly that inferior border. Now, we also know that many times, uh, even after rotation of threctomy, you'll have this lower uh, you know, one area of the wall uh, stent is still not fully expanded, uh, and uh, you, they, at some point you need to decide how far are you need to go further because sometimes you may rupture the vessel. And if, uh, like in this particular case, there is about 30% dent here, but in RO view looks uh, ne maybe less than 10%. I think it's about time to stop because going further uh, may be fraught with any uh, you know additional complication. I now, if you look at this original first picture. See where the lumen uh, for the RCA is, it's the uh, upper part of the vessel, which means the big chunk of uh, the etheroma and calcium is all the inferior border. So that's why I think when you, when you are doing this kind of uh, intervention, you have to decide, even suppose you decided that you are going to just go with a cutting balloon, not use any kind of etherectomy, that you go high pressure. Um, whatever, uh, 20 atmospheres. If you are going 22 uh, and 24 atmosphere, that's the time in this kind of eccentric lesion, you are the consider, uh, the, there is a risk of perforation. The so that is a limitation that once you have seen this kind of uh, eccentric calcium, you have done your atherectomy, you have done your high pressure balloon, you stent it. If you, if you have this residual 10 percent, you got to accept it and uh, call it a day and not get crazy going behind that uh, trying to uh, take that 10% uh, uh, away in the inferior border. The very large uh, conus branch uh, post uh, procedure has been gone. preserved. Did yeah. you notice that? It's One of the there. branches gone. Yeah. yeah. You see that? No. Go to minor. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. a very. You see okay. some dye staining. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's where you see a little. Hopefully, yeah. it will come back with a little yeah. nitro and. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, that our purpose is that we try to educate and be honest with what we do and uh, tell my viewers. So, I would say. In the algorithm, one point could be that if you think you are going to use a 2 ohm rota bar, because that's a large vessel, that much calcium, maybe that case should not be done with the orbital atherectomy. I think that will be the right statement to say. Like in this case, would have been a case of the 2 bar approach. We would not have used 2 ohm bar to directly, because very eccentric. We would have used 1.5 and 2 ohm, so that till we get a bigger orbital atherectomy bar of 1.5, which can give you bigger lumen of more than 2 millimeter. So if the decision is that you want, you would have used 2 millimeter rota bar that do not use the orbital atherectomy, go with the rotation atherectomy. I think this is why I would, my opinion, the teaching point uh, from the, uh, you know, orbital, from the atherectomy expert uh, having used both of them. Now, actually, although small 50 plus cases uh, of the orbital and uh, 5,000, 6,000 cases of the rota uh, or so, that uh, this will be one of the algorithm will be that if you decide the, of the more than 2 millimeter rota bar you think will require, then probably go with the rota in that case and don't use the orbital effect. I think those are all uh, fair points. Uh, looking at this view, I am, uh, uh, I think it is very wise to leave uh, uh, complete access to the, to the PDA by keeping the stent more proximal. Uh, uh, Samin, uh, take home message yep, uh, from you as point. well as from Anu. Yep, so that we will be uh, just finishing it exactly in one hour. Now, take home message on two points of the transradial PCI and the role of kissing balloon inflation. 
I know the transradial PCI used on gradual rise in the US with latest report being in high teens. TRI is, is uh, trended with lower bleeding and vascular complication but significantly higher exercise crossover to transfemoral approach. In STEMI patients, TRI is shown to be especially beneficial by reducing bleeding and perhaps mortality but as you require extra skills. So we need to have a more patients. You have experience on the TRI in a stable patient so you can do in a STEMI patients and really uh, benefit the patient. Second, in the few randomized trials have shown the futility of routine kissing balloon inflation bifurcation lesion. So that go away from it. Don't do routine uh, kissing balloon inflation. If side branch PTC is required after the main vas is stenting, then kissing balloon inflation is routinely recommended. Sequential balloon inflation rather than kissing balloon inflation has shown promising results, but need to have some clinical data. Final K KBI is essential in bifurcation re uh, lesions requiring two stent approach. So now it goes to our uh, three questions quickly. For the safe PCI trial, following statement is correct for the radial approach. Higher crossover to femoral approach, lower crossover to femoral approach, lower fluoroscopy duration, significantly lower bleeding and vascular complication in all patients, and significantly lower mortality. Uh, clearly, we have uh, the C, you know, I've shown this in the slide. Second, what percent of patients usually cross over to femoral approach from the radial approach in the trials of PRI, PCI? Less than 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, or more than 20. And the last is, Following statement is true for routine kissing balloon inflation in the treatment of bifurcation lesion. KBI reduces TLR, KBI re reduces stent thrombosis, KBI reduces peri-procedural MI, KBI re reduces overall MACE, and KBI is not beneficial routinely. So clearly answer those questions and uh, hopefully with the, we have made the point in all. Anu? Anu, technical uh, follow-up from you? Uh, technical, uh, I think one thing that which we forgot to, which I forgot to mention while we are placing the proximal stent, which you could probably see that we were struggling to get the 32 stent uh, into the prox. Though if, we are, if you see that we needed a body wire to get uh, the 16 stents, and I've shown you how when you are doing body wire, you can you usually go on uh, the we had fielder as well as run through. We went on the fielder, take the run through, keep in the proximal part and get your st uh, stent de um, deployed and then you can just go with the run through again because you need the body wire again for the mid and proximal. Now the proximal the issue was same it was a 32 longer stent and usually what happens they will enter the vessel the first 20 millimeter and then uh, the, since because of the calcium usually will not make a turn in that situation what you have to do is again get your wire as distally as you can get the guide into the ostium the uh, stent is still in the guide at that time and ask the patient to take a deep breath. These three steps are very important that your both the wires are very distal, guide is now sitting in the ostium, do not jam the guide uh, too much inside and with the deep breath we know the uh, vessel straightens and uh, the 32 we were able to get uh, into the vessel. After that you take out your uh, body wire out. And other point I want to make is in multi-vessel multi-lesion like we have shown here that uh, just take care of a few lesions, you do not have to go behind every, uh, every branch and uh, every vessel as long as I think proximal to mid part of the vessel, if you have uh, tackled two to three lesions, you are uh, good enough to relieve the symptoms in these patients. Anu, let me see if I get you clearly. So, you, this you use only for the right coronary artery to almost give you a more coaxial orientation by taking a deep breath? No, even the set. Even the set. Okay. Uh, LAD. Excellent. Some, right. Some, yeah, right, uh, right is more, but uh, LAD mid to distal, you can have a uh, difficulty in calcific lesions uh, that you will not be able to get uh, the stent in, especially the longer stents. Uh, so these three key, uh, key important point, deep breath really works. Excellent case. Uh, and uh, in that, if, if it still does not go, that's the time you think of guideliner. Wonderful. Uh, uh, that that's another uh, great suggestion. Samin, uh, where is your uh, next live transmission to? Uh, actually, we have the next week uh, live transmission to CRT on 25th, and then next month we have both 29th and 30th, Saturday and Sunday, uh, for one and a half hour for uh, ACC I2 summit uh, in uh, Washington D.C. Well, you will remain busy. I, I thank you both for uh, taking us through another uh, outstanding case uh, to our viewers. We'll be back uh, next month, March 18th. Till then, uh, I'm signing off.